<laughs> he has lived a life of basically a failed artist. Lobert actually admits in letters that he is influenced by Cervantes. Especially one of them has become a sort of guiding principle for my life. So that you can also hear a little bit of the original Spanish. Of all the literary characters that we have in the great books, the one readers identify with the most and love the most across the board is Don Quixote de la Mancha, Cervantes' 1605 novel. And in this video I want to talk about what I learned about this novel and Cervantes' life, uh, because I've had a couple of lectures on the book as many of you know, I study comparative literature and this is a very fundamental novel if you study anything to do with literature. I want to talk about translation. We're gonna try to translate the actual title together. That's gonna be fun. I want to talk about the influence this book had on other books and other thinkers and of course what Don Quixote is actually about and what the main theme of this book is and why I think it resonates with so many people. I also want to talk about how I slowly came to love this book and my own reading experience, my favorite quotes and, and how especially one of them has become a sort of guiding principle for my life. So we have a lot to get through. This might potentially become the longest video I've ever made <laughs> and I'm trying to film it on one of the shortest days of the year. So let's get into it. As always, I'll leave the timestamps in the description box below. So if you want to skip to a specific topic, then You'll find that in the box. Go right ahead. I also have my two copies of Don Quixote here. This is the Spanish version. It is abridged though. And this is the English translation, the John Rutherford translation available in Penguin Classics. So let's talk about Cervantes' life first and how he actually came to write this novel. So Cervantes didn't have an easy life at all. And we know quite a lot about him, uh, especially given the fact that he lived several centuries ago. You know, if we compare that to Shakespeare, for example, who we barely know anything about, the two are almost like the complete opposites, <laughs> even though they, they did live at the same time. He was born in 1547 in Madrid, close to Madrid actually, in Spain. And both Cervantes and Shakespeare died in 1616. And both actually also died on the 23rd of April. <laughs> so... Here's a little caveat though, it wasn't actually the same day that they died mm, because a different calendar was used. So Miguel de Cervantes died 10 days before William Shakespeare, even though both men died on April 23rd, 1616, which is by the way also the world day of the book. So I guess that is a date worth remembering. Uh, Cervantes was a soldier and later a tax collector and in 1571 he was participating in the sea battle of Lepanto which uh, yeah I, I watched a few history videos about that and it's actually quite wonderful to to see because it really gives you a sort of backdrop to the the world Cervantes lived in so I can highly recommend doing that and I guess overall it just made me appreciate how different the world was back then, how different the size of Spain was back then. And also to understand that Don Quixote is also quite representative for the time period that it was written in, but we'll get to that a little bit later. So in that battle of Lepanto, Cervantes got his left hand mutilated in battle. 
and later he spent five years in Tunisia. He was actually captured. And this period of captivity actually comes back a lot of times in Don Quixote. So in 1580, his family bought him out of captivity and he started working as a tax collector and he also starts writing at the time. He wrote mostly theater plays at first, which were never really a success at all. And then he got thrown into prison again <laughs> for apparently embezzling tax money. And in this period in prison, he conceived of Don Quixote. And uh, when he got out, he, he wrote the first part of this novel ferociously, apparently over the span of a year or even a little bit less. And you can you can see that actually in the introduction i'm gonna read you a couple of sentences how he talks about how this book was conceived in prison i think that's what he calls it so here's the first part of the prologue idle reader i don't have to swear any oath to persuade you that i should like this book since it is the son of my brain to be the most beautiful elegant and intelligent book imaginable but I couldn't go against the order of nature, according to which like gives birth to like. And to what can my barren and ill-cultivated mind give birth, except the history of a dry, shriveled child, whimsical and full of extravagant fancies that nobody else has ever imagined? A child born, after all, in prison, where every discomfort has its seat and every dismal sound its habitation. Oh, I really love that. I think the, the introduction <laughs> might be one of my favorite parts of the novel. Anyway, Cervantes is 57 years old at the time and he has lived a life of basically a failed artist he was bruised in battles he he was held captive twice he had no financial success and yeah he he only had 10 years to live at that point mm, but in this last period of his life he did get some recognition and success because don quixote was a success when it was first published and it was read quite a lot and it was not exactly seen as serious literature it was more of like frivolous entertainment at the time and he was influenced by a handful of different genres that were quite popular back then so you know people love to claim that Don Quixote is this extremely innovative piece which of course it is because he mixed those different genres in a very a particular way but also he based himself on on what was around at the time which i'm gonna just quickly go over because i think it's quite illuminating so the first sort of genre back then that Cervantes was influenced was the chivalric novel where everything was talked about in extremes and we see that coming back in don quixote a lot and that genre was not seen as serious or worth of any morality basically the second influence is the shepherd novel which is usually about a shepherd who has a lot of time to think about things uh, all day long because he has nothing to do so nothing really happens in terms of plot but it's a very philosophical piece usually uh, with a little love story sprinkled in and that was seen as serious and high quality literature and Cervantes's first novel by the way La Galadea was like this the third one that has been around at the time was the Icaro novel which was a Spanish Spanish genre <laughs> which was quite new at the time and it was an almost out of fictional text of a person like a narrator who is from a lower class and takes a very 
radical look on society and the higher classes and it's it's like a very satirical view on what our hierarchy is built on basically and Cervantes was also influenced by the Italian novella he actually was in Italy and and got to know it there so if you mix all of those together uh, yeah you you can you can see how something like Don Quixote could come out of it. So let's go back to the point on the novellas though, because Cervantes actually wanted to be Don Quixote a novella at first. So the first few chapters, I think 60 or 80 pages until Don Quixote comes back home after being bruised, that should have been just a novella, but he ended up writing more than a thousand pages of this big novel. Um, but also if you have even just leafed through Don Quixote you see that there's all these novellas sprinkled into the text that don't actually have a lot to do with the main plot of the book and he thought, like Cervantes thought that he might mix it up a bit by doing that and to to keep it interesting for the reader like that and funnily enough, most people actually <laughs> uh, have the opposite experience and find it a bit of a nuisance to have to go through all of these um, little novellas and it, it can be a little bit confusing. But it was set out to be entertaining <laughs> at first. And in the little bit of introduction that I just read to you, I think Cervantes is addressing a very poignant reality that I think is true for a lot of writers or at least they can relate to it where he describes his book as his offspring so yeah as I said Cervantes only had a little bit of fame at the end of his life and his work wasn't deemed high literature at all it it was sort of too successful for that like the masses loved it too much and there is a 10 year gap between publishing part one and part two of Don Quixote part two was published in 1615 and Cervantes felt quite rushed to publish this part two because a year before in 1614 an author called Avellandea brought out a part two of Don Quixote and basically fooled everyone thinking he was Cervantes just to make money and sell sell this novel and Cervantes was of course really upset about that and we don't really know who that person is who wrote the fake Don Quixote but it apparently Cervantes knew who did that and you know you have to imagine so many centuries back uh, <laughs> all these issues that we have around copyright and stealing ideas that was not really a thing back then so he could just do that and yeah so Cervantes was sort of forced to speed up finishing his part two of Don Quixote and it's funny like in in part two <laughs> Don Quixote himself tries to convince the reader and people he he meets in the novel that he indeed is the real Don Quixote and not the one from the fake novel. Yeah, so here you have a little bit of the background of Cervantes' life and how this novel came to be. Let's next talk about Spain at the time, a little bit of a historical perspective. So Don Quixote was written at the high point of the rena rena renaissance? Renaissance. <laughs> I'm gonna say Renaissance and basically in the Renaissance people in Spain thought very European and cosmopolitan there there was a, a tendency to few things humanistically and the Spanish Empire was huge at the time by the way and reached around basically the entire world and there was just a sentiment of being open to new trends new people new languages and the thing is as Cervantes gets older this seems to change again and go into the completely opposite direction so Spain is locking itself up again you couldn't study abroad anymore God is the center of people's moral life again and so he really lived in that transition phase between the Renaissance and the Baroque era. So let's talk about what Don Quixote is actually about and what makes it so special. 
because it is one of the few literary figures that we all have a picture in mind of. Even, even if you haven't read the novel, you probably have some kind of picture of Don Quixote in your mind. So one of the things that makes this book so special on a literary level is that back then in books there was no trace of metafictionality or self-referencing in books. And Cervantes did all that like a master in, in Don Quixote. So let me explain what these complicated terms mean. It basically means that Cervantes was aware of his own writing and he shows that in the text and he blurs the lines between the text and reality. You know, as Don Quixote, for example, is going to a bookshop and saying that he is the real Don Quixote, not the one from the plagiarized version, basically. Cervantes is also aware of the troubles of translation and tells us that, you know, before we can keep reading this book, someone first has to translate the next part to us. And Cervantes also references his own books, his own older books, as books that Don Quixote is reading <laughs> and uh, as part of the books that turn him mad, actually. So all of that is just genius. And today we take that kind of writing for granted because we live in a postmodern area where that is a very common practice but back then this sort of writing seemed to come out of nowhere and so let's get to the main theme of Don Quixote because the famous literary critic uh, Lionel Trilling said that all prose fiction is a variation of the theme of Don Quixote the problem of appearance and reality so what Don Quixote is about at its core is like that discrepancy between one's views and the actual world. So, you know, there are no knight errands anymore, <laughs> but he has such an idealistic mind, such a vivid imagination, that he just sort of forces that picture onto reality and makes it as though knight errands still exist and he fully lives in that world. And he, Don Quixote is sort of making up the facts of his life as he goes. And he forces the world in a way to fit into his view of it. Which actually is the fight of modernity, if you think about it. Because it is the fight of inside and outside and what the world really is and who is right. We have so many different views of the world and who's to say who's right, you know, is are politicians right or the pope or children you me who knows and of course our world is so com complex that we we need more than one model to understand it and it is this constant checking back with reality whether our view of it is actually correct that is a sort of art and of course that is <laughs> prone to lots of error and self-deception but that is sort of the struggle we have nowadays because all of our structures are gone you know the things that used to make life easier like having one god one religion one king modernity sort of broke up all of these rigid guidelines which causes us having to grapple with our worldview ourselves and that sort of yeah i think it was i don't know who it said anymore but that modernity begins the moment don quixote leaves his house and what this book shows really well as well is that we learn that that we run into problems when we're trying to explain everything with one model because then sooner or later either the outer world or our inner world breaks and if we look at Don Quixote as the main character of this book you know he's not our typical hero he's not young and good-looking he's in his 50s he's quite poor and he is like Spain at the time you know the gold the golden age and his golden age have come to an end and Don Quixote is sort of losing his mind because he has nothing to do we'll get into that uh, in a moment and he's reading too much and he essentially turns 
mad. I mean, there's so much discussion on whether he is mad or not, but what you can say for him is that he plugs into a sort of moral code that Spain no longer has. So the novel is really a criticism of Spain at the time, of of Christianity and of our sort of declining morals. <laughs> he takes his idealism really seriously. Right? We even have that saying of being quixotic, which means to have this sort of naive idealism that, that is like, considered way above what is what is normal or healthy and Don Quixote puts his ideals his morals and also the text above reality and that is just a very difficult to say whether that is a good thing or not because think about it in your, in your own life if you're inspired by a book if you're standing up for your morals that can be a good thing but of course, if you're not checking in with reality, it can turn to its flip side very quickly as well. So that, I think, is something that everyone can relate to in one way or the other. I certainly can. And some variation of this theme has been applicable to all our lives at some point. And I think it's the reason why this novel still resonates with so many people. And our teacher called this behavior textuelles Verhalten <laughs> in German, which basically means behaving according to a text. And he gave us the example of Christopher Columbus and how he also did that, which I just thought was was fascinating. And I, I want to take a moment and talk about this because it might give you a little bit of a reference point for what Don Quixote is doing in this novel and I also just found it a fascinating story in and of itself. So Christopher Columbus actually read a lot of uh, Marco Polo's diaries um, and Marco Polo spent a lot of time in China and was writing about apparently these cities with golden roofs and uh, Christopher Columbus was fascinated with with these descriptions of wealthy Chinese towns and cities so the diaries of Marco Polo and the Bible actually were Christopher Columbus's main travel guides when he discovered um, America and he somehow calculated apparently from the descriptions of the water in the Bible that there somehow must be so much water on the planet that it reaches all the way to China and that's where he wanted to go. Also in the Middle Ages there was this trend and urge in society to find paradise again. The lost paradise, um, the Eden of the Bible and people thought that it was still somewhere on the planet and they speculated where it could be. This hidden location. They thought that it was maybe somewhere in the jungle or in the African savanna or there were also rumors that it was a floating island in the Atlantic. And anyways, then he really does embark on his journey with his big ship and he was very well prepared. Again, his two travel guides in his pocket, many people, lots of food. And yeah, he just had all the things that he could need for a long travel on the ship. And if you read the diaries of the time, he actually talks about, you know, almost finding that floating island in the ocean because yeah he knew that they probably would have hit it if he went a little bit more north but today they stared a bit more south so they didn't quite find it and on october 12 1492 he actually lands on american ground i think it was one of the caribbean islands first and of course he was thinking he was in in india or china somewhere in asia right and <laughs> probably the indigenous people there were quite confused by this big ship and all the people that were docking there. But anyways, they get off the ship. Christopher Columbus thought, yeah, they must be, this must be it. This also looks like paradise, right? People are naked. Um, it, it, it gives a sort of Eden impression and he must be where Marco Polo was. And he did have a couple of translators with him on the boat. As I said, he was very well prepared. 
So they translated、uh, Arabic and Hebrew, <laughs> and they went up to the indigenous people, asking them, you know, where is the city with the golden roofs? And of course, these people didn't understand anything because they didn't speak Arabic or Hebrew.、Um, but those translators also felt a little bit bad for for not understanding what they were saying, and that they were like the translators were afraid. Well, maybe I'm I'm gonna get、uh, well. Christopher Columbus might get upset at us that we're not doing a good job, that that we're not understanding them. So they basically just said. Oh yeah, the indigenous people said that it was one. It, it's like a little bit further down, <laughs> so they had to get on the ship again and went a little bit further down. And then they asked the people again, and they again didn't understand anything. And they said, "Yeah, it's like it's the next island." <laughs> and so they kept going. They just kept trying to interpret a Chinese city into a Caribbean island. Which couldn't be more different culturally at the time, but Christopher Columbus just was convincing himself that he is on the right path. So we can see how dangerous and also funny it can be to stick to a text so much, and that we have to keep checking in with our reality. And I thought that was just a wonderful story to keep in mind when reading Don Quixote. Let's go to translation, which is maybe my favorite part, <laughs> because if we look at the original title of Don Quixote, it is actually El Ingenioso Hidalgo, Don Quixote de la Mancha, which I don't speak Spanish, so excuse my pronunciation. It's probably not correct. But we're really making it quite easy for ourselves to just say Don Quixote and just translate Don Quixote, because now every you know nowadays everyone knows who Don Quixote is, and and we have that sort of background. But if we look at the original title, I'm gonna put it on the screen. We can pick apart a little bit what the different words actually mean. So in Ginoso might be the simplest one to identify. Means something like ingenious in Spanish, right? So to be quick and inventive.、Uh, An hidalgo is a title of nobility at the time in Spain, and it literally means son of anyone. <laughs> so it's the lowest title of nobility at the time. And so many people were hidalgos, which basically meant they weren't they didn't have to pay tax, but also they weren't allowed to work. So they weren't allowed to earn money and that eventually led to a big economic crisis as you can imagine. And that's also the background of the story in this book, right? Don Quixote is also at home, he has nothing to do, he's not allowed to work. So he's an hidalgo. So we have ingenious, and we have the title of low nobility. Don of Don Quixote is something like a title, like sir. We don't really have that in in German, but in English it would be something close to a sir. And what a Quixote actually is is a grief. So a piece of armor to protect. The shin. <laughs> Nowadays, no one knows anymore what that is. I had to look that word up,、uh, but that is what a Quixote is. De la means of, and Mancha is a step territory in Spain, which literally means speckle or spot. So it probably looks speckled or spotted when you look at it from above. Because probably very dry. Now that you can sort of pierce together what all these words mean, I would ask you, how would you translate that? <laughs> Because it is sort of important to have all these details in. Because back then people knew what a hidalgo was, they knew what the title of don meant,、um, they knew what a Quixote was, or maybe they didn't know anymore. Actually, knighthood has been. Um, not a thing anymore for for a bit, and 
if you read it in Spain, you might actually also know where La Mancha is. So, how would you translate it? Maybe it would be fun to pause the video and comment below how you would translate it either to English or to your mother tongue. I would love to read that and there's no shame in <laughs> just giving it a try because all I'm trying to do here is to get it in your head how difficult it is to translate. So I'll give you an example of my own mother tongue which is German. So this is the first translation that came out in 1621 from Pasch vom Basteln von der Sohle. So are you ready? Here it is. <laughs> Don Quixote de la Mancha. Das ist die abenteuerliche Geschichte des scharfsinnigen Lehns- und Ritterassen Junker Harnsch aus Fleckenland. <laughs> and I had to, like the entire class laughed out loud when my teacher wrote that on the board because it's just so endlessly long and it sort of confirms the the prejudice we have towards I guess the German language of just having to be so thorough and explaining everything. But on second sight, also what our teacher said is that it's actually quite a faithful translation. And if we just quickly go through it, Don Quixote is <laughs> it's like a phonic spelling. So if you speak German you you can see that this is exactly how you have to say it, Don Quixote. Uh, then it says that is the adventurous story of the scharfsinnig, which means uh, to be sharp or astute. So I guess that would be the ingenious. Lehns uh, und Ritterassen, <laughs> that is a nobility designation of low mobility. And Junker as well. Harnsch is the grief, so the protection for the shin that we talked about even though no one knows anymore what that is today. Und aus Fleckenland means of the land of stains and spots. <laughs> and even though this looks a little bit ridiculous to us, actually Spanish-speaking people back then would have read all of that into the title. So <laughs> they knew what these words meant and and so in the end, even though it's a little bit funny, it is actually quite faithful translation. I'm not going to say much more on translation other than I have the John Rutherford translation and I'm super happy with it. Uh, it is it is apparently very recommended and, and gets across the, the fun and the wit of the story quite well. I also heard that Edith Crossman is a good translator of Don Quixote. And I think hardcore literature has an entire video <laughs> comparing, I think, 20 or so Don Quixote translations. So I can link that down below and in the cards so you can check that out if you're in the market for a good translation. Which I think is really important actually, otherwise, you know, the, the language can be quite archaic and and difficult to get into. And if my friend Alex wants, I'm convincing her to read a little bit of Don Quixote in Spanish because she's studying uh, Roman languages and she's very good at Spanish. And I'm trying to convince her to read a little bit of the text in Spanish for you so I can put it into this video. I would love that. Let's see if she does. Otherwise, I'm going to insert it now so that you can also hear a little bit of the original Spanish. Del buen suceso que el valeroso Don Quijote tuvo en la espantable y jamás imaginada aventura de los molinos de viento, con otros sucesos dignos de feliz recordación. En esto descubrieron treinta y cuarenta molinos de viento que hay en aquel campo, y así como Don Quijote los vio, Dijo a su escudero, la aventura va guiando nuestras cosas mejor de lo que acertáramos a desear, porque ves allí, amigo Sancho Panza, donde se descubren treinta o poco más desaforados gigantes con quien pienso hacer, hacer batalla y quitarles a todos las vidas 
con cuyos despojos comenzaremos a enriquecer, que esta es buena guerra y es gran servicio de Dios quitar tan mala simiente de sobre la faz de la tierra. ¡Qué gigantes! dijo Sancho Panza. Aquellos que allí ves, res respondió su amo, de los brazos largos, que los suelen tener algunos de casi dos leguas. Mire vuestra merced, respondió Sancho, que aquellos que allí se parecen no son gigantes, sino molinos de viento, y lo que en ellos parecen brazos son las aspas, que volteadas del viento hacen andar la piedra del molino. Bien parece, respondió don Quijote, que no estás cursado en este de las aventuras. Ellos son gigantes, y si tienes miedo, quítate de allí y ponte en oración en el espacio que yo voy a entrar con ellos en fiera y desigual batalla. So now I want to take some time and talk about some of the novels that you might know that have been influenced by Don Quixote and that theme, because it did have quite an influence quite early on. Apparently there was a carnival in 16... 15. There was a carnival in 1615 in Heidelberg, Germany, where apparently two people dressed up as Don Quixote and Sancho Panza, and they were expected to be recognized. So it had an influence on the culture, but it also had an influence on other writers. So Don Quixote was very well received in England, actually, and as early as 1752, uh, Charlotte Lennox wrote a book called The Female Quixote, <laughs> which is a novel. And, you know, that just tells us that she thought it was a good idea to put Quixote in the title because people would know that book. It is about a woman that reads too much and she's reading not chivalric um, novels, but love romance novels. And she basically thinks that she is a princess in her castle waiting for her prince to be rescued. So whenever like a handyman comes in or a, a mailman, she like falls in love with them. She's waiting to be saved. And it's it just becomes very strange, kind of. Until one day she runs after one of them, maybe the mailman or something. She stumbles and falls into the river and the cold water <laughs> just gives her a shock and sort of wakes her up out of her madness. And she realizes, no, I don't want to be with any of those men. I actually want to marry my cousin. <laughs> Which, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> that is such a weird twist. Yeah, then there's the 1742 Henry Fielding novel where he writes about uh, two people going through the, the streets of London in a like Don Quixote and Sancho Panza way. Also Jane Austen's North Hanger Abbey, which was actually her first novel, uh, talks about Catherine, the protagonist of the story and she's reading too many like horror novels and her own life is really boring and then eventually when she goes on vacation with her aunt and her uncle there's this young man and th there is actually a castle and these old walls and things become very spooky and she's she's like yeah finally now all the things are gonna happen that I always read about. And then maybe the most well-known novel that is influenced uh, by Don Quixote is Gustave Flaubert's Madame Bovary that came out in 1857. And Flaubert actually admits in letters that he is influenced by Cervantes. So we're, we're, we can be sure that this is where he got the idea from. And Madame Bovary also reads too much, but she doesn't just read one genre, she just reads a lot uh, across the board. She's very naive and she sort of takes everything for true that she reads and wonders why her own life is so boring. 
and she she tries to sort of take some of the things that she is reading over into her, her own life and it is also about that discrepancy between the illusion she has and the reality and uh, yeah i'm not gonna tell you how that ends because our teacher did and he completely spoiled it <laughs> for us but yeah that is gustave flaubert dostoevsky was also influenced by don quixote in the idiot and he actually also said that his uh, mushkin the main character of the story he based him on don quixote and christ because he says those are the two purest souls that had that have ever lived so he also chose that similarity on purpose so now to end it all i just want to give you my own reading experience uh, which is a sort of opinion of mine up until now because I haven't finished the book and I also feel like I'm constantly changing my mind about it even just this week when I was preparing this video and I read back through the text a little bit again it somehow oops it somehow felt so dear to my heart again and yeah so as you know I I had to read the first, I don't know, 130 pages or so for university for my course. And I was quite glad that someone finally forced me to pick up this book. And our teacher really said, you know, you cannot study literature until or unless you, you've read Don Quixote at some point. And I got a strong impression that it's his favorite novel. And I just heard so much about the influence of this book and how much people love it that I I was a little bit skeptical whether I was gonna like it because the theme of it like sh chivalry and <laughs> yeah it just didn't really seem like my thing I'm also not into adventure stories a lot but when I started reading I just I thought the prologue was fantastic one of the best things I've ever read and just within the first 30 pages or so, I caught myself laughing out loud, I think four or five times. And and I was somehow so... I, it almost felt like a, a childish part inside of me was spoken to. Like it was such a weird humor <laughs> that I just... I found really funny and, and at the same time those like brutal scenes also also shocked me so it, it was a little bit of a roller coaster ride and it it I was I was quite astonished how how it could trigger all these emotions inside of me. I also felt quite a lot of pity towards Don Quixote which didn't make it easy to read for me but overall I just really enjoyed the first 80 or so pages. And I heard afterwards that, you know, Cervantes planned on writing a novella and that that should have actually been the entire book. And and I'm like, yeah, that would have been a fantastic book and I would have probably reread it and found it really good. So I, I want to read that again. Probably the rest is good as well. I'm not uh, drawing any conclusions there, but yeah, I just really liked the beginning like until he comes back i feel like that is already a complete story in and of itself i do want to read you one of my <laughs> favorite quotes <laughs> um when don quixote and sancho panza are with the goat herds and they're talking and <laughs> the goat herds are constantly misspelling everything so in, in my edition that is page 90 and 91 and I don't know why, but I just laughed out loud reading that. I found it so funny <laughs> because even though it's a really simple humor. Uh, anyways, in particular, people said he knew all about the science of the stars and what the sun and the moon do up there in the sky because he used to tell us exactly when the eclipse were going to come. Eclipse. 
is the word, my friend, not Calypse. <laughs> For the abstraction of the two great luminaries, said Don Quixote. But Pedro, not troubling himself with trifles, went on with his story. And he also used to predict whether a year was going to be fruitful or hysterical. <laughs> you mean sterile, my friend, said Don Quixote. <laughs> Sterile or hysterical, replied Pedro. It all boils down to the same thing. <laughs> and then a little bit later. It's possible and more than possible that you won't hear anything like it in all the days of your life, even if you live to be older than noses. <laughs> Moses, you should have said, interrupted Don Quixote, who couldn't abide the goat herds word mingle m words word mangling. <laughs> So anyways, when I read what I had to read for uni, I, I put the book away again because, yeah, after page 90 or so, I didn't super like it anymore, but it kind of just kept staying in my mind. And I was on a microdose of LSD one day and I remember just sort of looking at the book and I realized what like what it was that sort of kept drawing me back to it and it was that I could really relate to the characters to both of both of them but not in in the sense of yet yeah, the discrepancy between the inner world and the outer world but more the discrepancy between the mind and the body um, like to me Don Quixote is just so how my mind works I can be very idealistic I can think big um, and then Sancho is more how my body works and my body wants to take it slow and the two of them sort of have to have to find a way to get on with each other and as someone who used to have an eating disorder I feel like I was very much very divided in what my mind and my body wanted my overly idealistic mind and my very poor and silenced body <laughs> and over time they've just sort of listened to one another and became friends and I'm I don't know I'm almost f I'm feeling a little bit emotional because I feel like that's also what you can observe in this story of them which is benefiting from one another and so I feel like something inside of me just latched on to those two characters like archetypes and uh, Don Quixote is just standing for the the spiritual the idealistic and Sancho more for the physical and then I talked to Eric about it and we also realized that in our relationship <laughs> this comes back as well Eric is extremely idealistic and always has grand plans and I'm always the Sancho who is like bringing him back down to earth and making things making him see things realistically <laughs> so yeah i i think once your perception is a little bit open to these dualities you can really get so much out of this book and interpret so much into it and and that's extremely valuable and i feel like i can appreciate it now and i do want to keep reading it and I, I just want to end with my favorite quote, which is when Don Quixote says that this is not an adventure of islands, it's an adventure of crossroads. Um, because Sancho wants to, you know, go to this promised island where he can be king of the island or something like that. And Don Quixote says this is not an adventure of islands, it's an adventure of crossroads. And it's just was such a wonderful way of saying that at all times in our lives we're at crossroads and we can choose to go either way and it just really helps to take the focus off these big main goals and just ignore all the little 
crossroads that are there along the way. And that is just a quote that is really growing on me. And that I also, I almost want to hang it up on my door to read before I leave my apartment. I think I want to do that. Yeah. So thank you so much for listening to this video. Um, tell me what you thought in the comments. I know a lot of people love this novel. I, I always get so many positive comments of people when I talk about Don Quixote or even just post a video, which by the way, the community tag of YouTube, um, you, you can check that out. I sometimes post things there. I post polls and questions and pictures. It's, it's completely free. Um, but I thought I would I would mention it. And anyways, people seem to love Don Quixote. And I think I'm slowly starting to get why. So I hope you enjoyed this video. And I'll see you again very soon. Thank you. Bye bye.